It is a pleasure and an honor to speak about the work of Evel Gorham, uh, particularly to this group. When was the last time you thought about acid rain? For many of us in the room, we thought about it a lot 30 or 40 years ago, but most of us haven't thought about it for decades. Why is that? Well, we realized that acids were falling from the sky and polluting our lakes around the 1950s. And then we did something about it. We changed policies here in the US in the 1970s and late 80s through the Clean Air Act, and things got better. Here's the evidence. On the left is uh, measurements and a map of basically sulfur deposition showing that there's high sulfur deposition um, in the late uh, 1980s uh, before the, the second round of Clean Air Act uh, legislation was enacted. And then the same map in the mid 2000s showing how much sulfate concentrations had decreased. This is one of the great uh, stories that I talk about in my limnology class to my students. The reason we knew that acid rain was a problem is because this man had questions about how soils and plants respond to acid in their environment. Why was he interested in this question? Plain and simple, he was curious. He may be the most curious person I have ever met in my life, and certainly the person who has been best able to turn curiosity into policy that matters. Evel Gorham recognizes the importance of curiosity as exemplified in this quote from him. The best science usually comes from one's fascination with the natural world, often without regard to any practical concern, but it can often lead to results of practical importance. Evel attributes most of his success to happenstance and his curious mind. Let's examine some of that happenstance. He was curious about salmon and egg development at different temperatures as a master's student um, at Dalhousie University in his native Nova Scotia. He then went on to do a PhD at University College in London um, where the effects of acids on soils and plants captured his interest. Later, he moved to Sweden to further address this issue in bog systems. After that, he moved back to England, this time as a research scientist with the Freshwater Biological Association in the English Lake District. And this is where he started to make connections between fallout from the atmosphere and acidity in soils and plants. He moved back to Canada for a faculty position at Toronto and then came to the U of M in the early 1960s. One of the reasons his curiosity uh, paid off, uh, one of the reasons his curiosity paid off is that he was not just curious about biology. He learned about the surrounding rocks, soils, and landscapes and how the movement of water over these entities affected the composition of water in lakes and ponds. This is a picture I took a few years ago when I was in the English Lake District. And these are the kinds of system that Evel was working in, as well as bogs. For me, his ability to be interdisciplinary before this was really even a thing is perhaps what I admire most about him. Unlike lakes where most of the water runs over the landscape or through the soils before coming into aquatic systems, in bogs the hydrology is driven by what falls from the atmosphere as snow and rain. Evel noticed that when the wind blew from the ocean, inputs to bogs were dominated by sea salts. But when the, blue in, but when the wind blew in from nearby industrial areas, atmospheric inputs to the bog were more acidic, dominated by 
mostly sulfuric compounds, falling from nearby factories and mines, mostly mines. While acid rain had been recognized since the 1800s, its significance was not understood until the work of Evel and some of his contemporaries came to light, showing that atmospheric fallout led to acidification of lakes, rivers, and forests. While working in bogs, he noticed that plants also had high concentrations of radioactivity. Comparisons with herbarium specimens suggested not only were the mosses and lichens accumulating radio, uh, radioactive fallout, but levels were elevated nearly 50 times uh, greater than uh, during this, uh, since the beginning of the nuclear era. It wasn't just local nuclear accidents that was causing this. It was far away nuclear explosions having a huge impact. And it didn't stop at the plants. The radioactivity accumulates in animals that eat those plants, for instance, reindeer, which feed on lichens, and even the humans that eat the reindeer. This work and similar studies eventually led to the International Nuclear Test Ban. But it took a good bit of activism for the issues that he knew were important and relevant to all of our lives to um, make a difference. In this way, Evel's curiosity has changed our world for the better. In this diagram, I'm showing you a picture of a peat bog, but over there on the right is a core from a lake. And that core from the lake, basically, uh, this is one of the great tools that paleolimnologists and paleoecologists can use. And basically, at the top of the core, um, you can look at what's happening on the landscape and in the lake today. And as you go back deeper into the core, you go back in time, okay? This is an important point because you can use these cores to understand how things have changed over time. One of the important questions that Evel is working on today has to do with what happens with all the excess carbon dioxide that we are adding to the atmosphere. In the late 1990s, he and Walt Dean published a fantastic paper showing that a surprisingly large quantity of carbon was ending up in the bottom of lakes, reservoirs, and peatlands. Until they did this work, none of us had any clue that these systems might be important for our understanding of how the Earth is responding to human effects on the global carbon cycle, particularly in freshwater systems. How did he figure all this out? He was just curious. And uh, I'm for we're fortunate today that Evel is in the audience, and uh, I would ask Evel, I don't know where you are, and I can't see a thing, but I would ask you to stand up so that we can recognize you. <laughs> 